So normally we have a city councilor here, which means that uh, you get a politician. But instead, today you get a professor. And uh, if you think politicians speak for a long time, well, I'm used to 50 minutes for a class. But I'll try to make it really short. The words working for peace have come out a few times, and it's important to recognize that. I dare say that most people hold to a general idea that peace is good, and it is. But peace is also work. It requires peacemaking and peace building, especially in our society with its values, its norms, its common sense that make peace an unusual sort of thing. And peace a harder reality than the good idea and the pleasant feelings. So the acknowledging of indigenous lands that we're on, that we've just done, is an example of reformulating our social relations. And I didn't say reforming, I said reformulating. In other words, we are learning new ways to rethink how we live well together on the land, and that's vitally important. So let me use that phrase as my theme today, to live well together on the land. Make no bones about it, we should imagine peace, as John Lennon sang about, but also to be very clear-eyed in the ways that we think about peace. Last year, a number of people from the Edmonton Interface Center and other Edmontonians went to the Parliament of the World's Religions. And while there, one of the speakers was most inspiring to me. Now, the Parliament of the World's Religions is a gathering every few years of thousands of people from around the world to promote interfaith harmony. This speaker, Tarak Ramadan, from England, said, Stop cheering at everything I say that you like. Stop cheering me at everything that you agree with. And then people cheered, of course, and he said, Stop! We all know that we want interfaith harmony, but it will not happen with cheering. You need to think hard and act harder to make harmony a reality even among the disharmonious forces and competing interests in our world. So it is with peace. And I ask, do we wage peace as hard as those who practice to wage war? It doesn't help that we who would promote peace often do it fuzzy-headedly. I have a friend with whom I share pieces of value with who said to me a couple days ago, impressions, judgments, and expectations. The world would be a better place to live without any of those. Well, maybe, but to live, we make judgments. We use impressions. We go into a situation and form an impression, then judge the situation. How do we act here? Is this likely to be safe? Is this going to be interesting? Is that person worth becoming a friend with? Is this employee working out, or does that employee need to be let go? What is the best way to ecological sustainability? or making a policy that will lessen poverty, or any of the number of other everyday things that we do together to live well together in the land. These are judgments, these are impressions, and we do that. The problem is when we cement these judgments and impressions into place and do not allow them to change, then it is that my impression becomes the truth. So the world is bigger than us as individuals, and I don't have good answers for the question of how governments can do peace like individuals try to. But I will say as a professional social scientist that I'm aware of the extensive research literature that there are good answers out there for working for peace at all levels, from the individual all the way up to intergovernmental relations. We live on a finite planet. And I know that the data shows that there are not enough resources for all humans to live well. There are some who take more than is needed for them to live well. And this is not the way to peace either. I speak of us, too. As Canadians, we are in the top 5% of the world. And many of us are in the top 1%. And if that challenges you, I suggest a website called uh, globalrichlist.com, where you plug in your income and you see exactly where you are. I'm about the 70th uh, percentile in Canada, which puts me in the top half of 1% in the entire world. That blew my mind. I thought I was aware before that. Wow, I'm way more aware now. We are the global elites. And there's something wrong when we think of all people as one, because we are not. We live with positions of privilege and advantage. 
So listen to brothers and sisters from the, around the world. This is part of the way towards peace, to listen. A church leader from the Pacific Islands. He cannot go back to the family home where he grew up. Sea level rise is called saltwater intrusion into the groundwater. There is no fresh water to drink there. I don't have to face that. That is what my privilege enables. Or an African indigenous spiritual leader from the Sub-Sahara. The sacred groves near her home are no more. Some were cut for firewood by people with few other means to cook food. Some have died because climate change has caused desertification and the trees cannot live where there is no water. I don't have to face that either. This is what our privilege enables. But here's what I do have to face when they tell me these stories and they look back at me and I look back at them. The question is what to do with the advantages that come from our position of global privilege. How can we put more work into the peace making and peace building, ensuring us that all of us in the world live well together on the planet? Thank you.